that's why you put it in there. That's why it's there. That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, the next slide shows, um, well, we've already gone past that, our schedule of events. And, of course, this is Sunday. And uh, the speaker is Bill Watson. And tonight at 730, we have a pine ice cream social. And then I'll just talk about tomorrow and the next day. And, and, and we'll, we'll cover the rest as, as we go. But we're going to have a, an interactive discussion tomorrow. Uh, we call it part one. And I can't see all of what that says. And I just changed the thing. You there. have to go back and slide that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, a faith misplaced in a culture of liars. And, and we use Isaiah 59 as our, I don't know, text or outline, whatever you want to look at. Uh, you can go look at Isaiah 59 and you can see all of the fun things that were going on in Israel uh, at that particular time. And we're going to be talking tomorrow, kind of, I wouldn't say a comparison, but, you know, showing that, uh, you know, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the heavens and uh, this country is is falling apart. Uh, and Prasad is from India and he can tell us his country's already falling apart and is getting worse. And then Tuesday, part two of that is going to be a better world and talk about the good things that we have coming. So uh, that's the, the next couple of days of our uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker for today, Bill Watson. Bill was ordained into the ministry in 1986. Uh, that was uh, not that it matters, but it was at the Church God International. He is a minister everywhere, but he's officially a minister in the Church God International. And he presently serves as the Northern Regional Coordinator and Pastor of the Church God International in Cleveland and Akron, Ohio, uh, in the United States, of course. He, he serves, he has served as the chairman of the Church God International Ministerial Council for many, many years, but they have term limits and his term uh, was up. And now Mike Nolan is uh, the chairman of that, uh, of that group right now. But Bill is a very vocal uh, and valuable member of that, of that uh, board. Uh, it's a board of ministers. And he's a member of the Church God International's Canadian Board of Directors. He uh, is very much involved in the international news, the, 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 the newsletter of the Church God International. He's the managing editor for Prevail Magazine, and he's a, he's a, a, a very common speaker. I shouldn't put it that way. Bill's not a common speaker. He's, he's a very... <laughs> Often speaker on on the arm arm. How did, I get, did I get out of that? Okay, Bill. You got it. You're you're all right, Skip. You're all right. Frequent. That's a good word. Frequent. <laughs> Frequent. There you go. Uh, of the uh, Armor of God uh, program through the Church God International. Uh, he's the man. Uh, he's uh, responsible for publishing multiple booklets. If you go into the Church of God International and look at their book booklets, you'll see that Bill has authored or co-authored many of those. Uh, and uh, he's presenter of the Armor of God uh, program, which is the Church God International telecast that's on the, on the internet and a, a few television networks worldwide. As you all know, we are now in a time of electric, electronic media. And, um, you know, Paul might have been really happy to have had some of the media that we have. On the other hand, I don't think he would have liked Facebook. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for Paul. We can ask him about that when we see him in the kingdom. Uh, so anyway, I will, uh, I will hush and I will turn it over to uh, uh, a pastor and leader in, in, in the churches of God, uh, Bill Watson. Thanks, Skip. Appreciate it very much. And hello, everybody. Uh, Although I see little black dots across the top of my screen, I trust that uh, everyone is doing okay. 
and uh, enjoying this very much to re be remembered Feast of Tabernacles uh, because it is truly a historical event we're all experiencing with the way that uh, we are keeping the feast this year in light of the fact of this uh, Chinese virus that has pretty much hit many, many of us and has infringed upon our ability to move freely uh, from location to location. But it is good to be with you and we're making the best of it. And I, I really do uh, thank Skip and Mike uh, as well for the technical backup support, bringing this all together and being able to provide uh, a means by which uh, we can all uh, share in some time, sharing God's word, uh, uh, spreading the gospel, uh, enriching our faith and all the things that go along with enjoying the Feast of Tabernacles and being the beneficiaries of this, this little section of time that we call this um, feast, uh, these eight days that provide us with such a opportunity to, uh, as I say, spend time in the word and uh, share that with each other. I uh, bring you greetings uh, from uh, about 75 folks here in Medina, Ohio. Medina is south of Cleveland, uh, over on the south shore of Lake Erie, about 20 miles, and uh, is also northwest of Akron. So we're kind of right in between Akron and Cleveland, Ohio. And that's where I'm coming from you, my home here in Hinkley, a little place, a little dot that's even smaller than Medina that uh, has about maybe 10,000 people at most that uh, live here in this little township. But at any rate, uh, I bring you greetings from about 75 folks that are keeping the feast here in our church-owned building. We actually have a building here that uh, CGI, the Church Guy International, owns, and uh, it has uh, really facilitated us with a lot of benefit in being able to uh, have a facility whereby we can use it anytime we want, any day of the week we want, for anything we want. And that really does provide us with a lot of freedom to uh, preach the gospel and uh, have additional meetings. Matter of fact, we're in the midst right now of developing, I don't know how many of you know this or not, uh, a radio studio inside one of the offices we're converting to a radio uh, studio so that we can do live radio telecasts through our internet radio network that is managed by the Church of God International Congregation up in Toronto, uh, Canada. And uh, we are on internet radio. That is, we have our whole uh, network, CGI radio network, 24-7. Uh, we have music. We have pre-recorded primarily most sermons and and discussions and what have you on that, but we're going to try to start doing live programs as well, and that's what this uh, radio studio is going to be all about. But I'll tell you, it's a techno technologically developed age. Uh, Skip put his finger on it uh, very well. The technologies that we have today, which provide us with the opportunity here to do these kinds of miraculous things. I mean, uh, uh, bringing Paul's name back up, uh, like it or not, I'm sure they would be amazed at what we do and how we do it today with all the things that we have uh, to do. So um, I just wanted to mention all of that uh, to all of you before we get started here, because obviously um, I want to share some things here with the Word of God as well and uh, bring your attention to um, some things that uh, are really important for us, I think, to keep in mind, to consider seriously, because the feast is an enriching opportunity. It really does provide us with a lot of a lot of. Um, opportunity to consider things that maybe we don't have time during the week in our normal state of affairs in dealing with our lifestyles and going to work and all of that. So things kind of slow down in the feast and gives us opportunity to really get into the word. And and this time is, is a time for all of us, I think, uh, to really keep in mind about why we are here. And I, that's what I like about the feast, because it does bring us full circle to consider our destiny, why we were born, what all of this is all about. Why do we eat? Why do we drink the water we drink? Why are we doing the things that we do and pick up the challenges that we do and having opportunities in life that uh, uh, sometimes do challenge us in ways that uh, only God knows because he has an idea of where he wants to take us in the development uh, that he has put us into and with his calling because we are called for a great, great purpose, brethren, a, a tremendous purpose, a purpose of becoming kings 
and priests in his government. And that is a tremendous privilege, a tremendous opportunity, and something that all of us should hold dear uh, to our minds and hearts because it is a, a big responsibility, quite frankly. And uh, in this case, uh, does provide us with uh, certain visions and certain understandings about what our life in particular, our Christian life in particular, is all about. And there is one underlying uh, reason the Feast of Tabernacles should bring home to all of us. And I would like to share this with you and bring it to a point today uh, that hopefully will add some light to the word liberation. This is an underlying theme of the feast, liberation, because it is a very liber uh, liberating message that the Feast of Tabernacles has. When you think about it, we are being called to essentially run the world under the leadership of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, in modern vernacular, we're gonna defund the police. We're gonna defund the military. We're gonna defund a lot of things that today exist that will not need <laughs> to exist in the millennium. That's right, we are going to have opportunity to beat swords into plowshares. We're gonna have opportunity to learn no more the ways of war, but instead how to work cohesively, synergetically with the world and the environment and all the things that we struggle with as a human existence in our human level today, with all of the things that we're surrounded with and the hostilities and violence, all of that, brethren, is going to be removed. It's going to be eliminated, defunded, re uh, completely disarmed and disbanded in some cases because there won't be any need for militaries. There won't be any need, hopefully, for police, because we will be essentially the managers of the world. You and I truly are being called into some very, very privileged roles. And that's why it is so very important that we learn the ways of Jesus Christ. Christ set us an example. He really did in so many ways, even in keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm sure I'm speaking to a, an educated audience to a certain degree with regards to God's word. And I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, are very familiar with John 7, where Jesus was uh, found keeping the feast. And in his day, of course, we know that uh, the hills and all the area, the landscape around Jerusalem, was scattered with all kinds of sukkahs. I mean, there were all kinds of little lean-tos that were propped up and set up for this, this eight-day festival, of which today, this year we're in day two now. And uh, and I think um, uh, Prasad, he's, he's moving on into day three already over there in India. But at any rate, the point of it is in Jerusalem was quite a, quite a different scenario, quite a different state of affairs with, with these little sukkahs all over the place and with uh, the uh, celebration of all the kids, the chatter and all the cacophony going on with the families and the fires at night. And of course, with all the Levitical rituals that went on with the water and the, the torches, the things that many of us are familiar with that went on at the feast. It was a fun time. It was a great time. It was a time to rejoice. It was a time to be happy. It was a time that was, in, in many respects, to be the beneficiaries of all of your hard work throughout the year. It was a harvest, a harvest season, a harvest time. And those of us today in this 21st century, why we have opportunity to realize even a more expanded idea, concept, and truth of what this harvest season really means because you even though we have an underlying an underlying theme of liberation associated with the feast the fact of it is the commonality that jesus christ brings to our understanding about the feast gives us the enrichment to realize this harvest season this harvest time the feast of tabernacles is about not harvesting fruit, not harvesting vegetables. 
It's about harvesting human beings, brethren, harvesting you and harvesting me, harvesting us to become a different type of species, a being, a spirit being that Jesus shared with Nicodemus. He called it spirit. Nicodemus was so surprised that night that he was talking with Jesus there in John 3. We have the story there written by John the Apostle. But when Nicodemus met up with Jesus in that evening, he was incredulous with what he was hearing when Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, you don't get it. You got to be born again. You got to, what's born of spirit is spirit. What's born of flesh is flesh. There's a distinction here, my friend. And they went at it that, uh, that evening in a, friendly, in a friendly conversation. Nicodemus wasn't hostile. Nicodemus wasn't trying to catch Christ in any kind of, uh, you know, gaff or anything. He was sincerely there looking for answers to what is really waiting for us on the other side of death. What is the truth about life after death? And I'll tell you, Jesus gave him, he gave him a mindful. It was so much so that even we read there in John chapter three, uh, probably around verse 10, I think, or so I'm not gonna turn there now because I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but Nicodemus himself, he says there, how can these things be? You know, he, he was, like I said, he was incredulous over what Jesus was telling him. It's like the wind, Nicodemus, you know, what do you mean the wind, Jesus? And, uh, doing the best he could, Jesus was trying to describe to uh, Nicodemus there about this thing called spirit life, about being born again, about the true liberation of you and me into this condition that we ourselves now are not subject to death anymore. We're no longer finite, we're infinite in the sense that we will be immortals. We will be given immortality as part and parcel to the reward by which Jesus will give us upon the vetting process, a successful vetting process that hopefully we will be able to accomplish through the life that he has given us as we continue through uh, this physical life. And not that we're saved by works, but we are rewarded by works. And I think it's all of us to, to recognize that that is a very big truism to realize. And so we have quite a, quite a future. And that, that's my point. The destiny that you and I have in front of us is an amazing destiny. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to bring your attention over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, because I think it's important for us to take a little bit of time to consider this material in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, with what Paul had to say about this destiny that all of us have. And it is, I think, very appropriate for all of us at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And here at the outset, especially day two, going into it, uh, I think it would be remiss of us not to take some time to consider what we have waiting for us, why we are and should be rejoicing, why we should be happy about what we have and where we are going, regardless of what we're surrounded by, regardless of the country we may live in, regardless of the challenges in our personal lives we may be going through, be they health problems, be they marital issues, be they career issues, or just frankly, anxieties and stresses that we've accrued over the years of our life due to our experiences and the attempts that we engage in in trying to untangle ourselves from our own baggage that we carry throughout our lives. The fact of it is, putting all that to the side for these eight days, we really do have something to be gay about, <laughs> be happy about, to be, be overjoyed about, because frankly, we've got something that is priceless in nature. And what Jesus Christ is offering us here, he is described a bit by Paul when he says, you know, some will say, how are the dead raised up? This is verse 35, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he says, with what body do they come up in? Or what, do they, uh, what body do they come? And it, so often we forget about the fact that the whole Bible itself is about this harvest, about this God event of him, his reproducing himself 
through humankind and the impregnation of God's Holy Spirit to bring us to a fruition experience. And that fruition experience, Jesus called it being literally, literally born again of some material that he called spirit, Numa. He called it this spiritual material that is going to be truly liberating. And I keep coming back to that word because the ultimate conversion you and I are aspiring to is the conversion of us, not only our minds. Yes, that's important. It's important right now. We get our characters in line, that we get our, our minds and our thoughts and our emotions in line with God's word, the Torah, the writings, the prophets, and of course the epistles and all the words of Jesus. But it's also the ultimate conversion will be complete when you and I are brought to a full birthing process and undertake the experience the experience of what the, of the Apostle Paul right here attempts to describe for each and every one of us. So I think because he took time to write it, let's take some time here to explore it as he wrote it. And in, in verse 36, he says, and you got to love Paul. He says, you fool, you got to like, like him or, or uh, hate him. But Paul was quite direct. He says, that which you sow is not quickened except to die. And then he proceeds through this litany of describing different bodies. Uh, terrestrial, celestial, fleshes of uh, different types of fish and birds and, and beasts, trying to draw this association over the fact that there are differences. There, there are different things that are uh, basically distinct from one another. And he says here, there's one glory in verse 41, 1 Corinthians 15, of the sun and another of the moon. There's different stars, they have uh, differences of glory. And then he draws the connection. He comes full circle in verse 42 to es essentially illustrate what he's really talking about. And he says here, so also is the resurrection. So here comes the association, the resurrection of the dead. In other words, there's a distinction to be made between you and I now and what we're going to become. And this is the point Paul's trying to make. And this Feast of Tabernacles comes back and hits on these bases. It sparks this information, or at least it should, to each and every one of us to keep this in focus because this is the vision for why you were born. This is the reason for what you are doing, what you're doing, so that you can achieve and accomplish the fact of your servanthood to the rest of humanity, but instead of in your physical condition, empowered in a whole different type of material that Paul describes as well as spirit. Notice this, in verse 42, we continue. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. So there's an association here. What we have now is corruptible. It's gonna corrupt, it's gonna die, it's gonna rot, it's gonna disappear, dust you are, dust we return. And Paul gets to that, he's making this point. It's sown in dishonor, verse 43, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power, power. It's sown a natural body. So you see people in a coffin, you, you think back, you know, funerals you've attended in your life. If you have attended any funerals and you've witnessed a, a body that is lifeless there being displayed at the funeral, and you, you see that it's natural, it's, it's made of flesh, physical, it's finite. It has a beginning, it has an end, at least in that context. And Paul is making this point clear here in verse 44. It's sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. That's important. That's important for every one of us to recognize that there is a physical body. As much as you're sitting there, wherever you may be, in your home with a group of people, uh, with your family surrounded, uh, uh, surrounded uh, in, on chairs around a table. The point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is as much of the reality that you are taking up in time and space is the proof, it's the legitimization, it's the validation that there is a spiritual, a spiritual body too. And that's what Paul is telling us to do. If you believe, in your self-actualized existence, in your consciousness, where you are sitting there, seeing all the things around you and 
the table and all the molecules that we see and envision uh, from our eyes and comprehend into our brains, Paul is saying that's validation. That's the legitimization of a spiritual body on the other side, on the other side of this threshold. That's important. Notice this, what he says and how he characterizes it. Back to 44, verse 44, 1 Corinthians 15. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. I like this. I, I, I just, this is one of my favorite verses, one of my favorite statements in the Bible. There is a natural body. I don't even have to look at it. <laughs> and there is, he says, without a doubt, there is a spiritual body. Verse 45. And so it's written. And then he proceeds to draw this association of physical and spiritual about Adam being the representation of the physical. He says, there's a first man, Adam, which was made a living soul. And the last uh, was made a quickening spirit, referencing Christ in this metaphor, in this figure of speech, in this association, in this allegory that he's trying to draw up here so that we've got a comparison to measure by. And he goes on and he says in verse 46, how be it that there was first a spiritual uh, there, he says here, how be it that there was not, I'm sorry, it was not first a spiritual, but that it was natural. In other words, the first, the, the, to get out of the box, to get this thing started, we're in a condition whereby we are destructible. We are corruptible. We, we can be destroyed. We, we can be eliminated. We can be basically temporarily in a condition that can be exhumed if need be and if necessary. And that correlates with, and we understand, I think, and are old enough and adult enough about the fact to recognize that the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23, you know it as well as I do, right? Wages of sin is death. It's discontinuation of life. We're in a reality of life or death. It's not eternal life being tormented. It's life in, in God's kingdom, or it's non-existent. It's, it, it's, to be um, exhausted, done, over. Uh, you are disconnected like a computer. You unplug it, the screen goes dark, and it's off. There's nothing uh, lively about an unplugged computer in that regard. And so here we see this association that the first was not spiritual, but it was natural. Afterward, verse 40, that we're in verse 46 now, uh, afterward, that which is spiritual. Verse 47, here we go now. The first man is of the earth. Now we get right down to the nuts and bolts. We're in the meat and potatoes about this now. He is making it very clear that natural person, that natural body is earthy. It is sinew and bone. It's blood. It's capillaries. You know, it's all the things that you and I are made up of, tendons and muscle. And he says it is earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, and we understand the association here. Verse 48, as is the earthy, so uh, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are uh, they as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And he goes on in verse 49, and as we have born, or in this case, phoreo, that's the, uh, the Greek word, if my uh, note here is right, my, uh, it's never my eyesight, by the way, it's the lighting, it's always the lighting, it's, I'm just kidding though, but I think it's phoreo, the Greek word phoreo, uh, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bear again, phoreo, the image of the heavenly. So again, what Paul's doing here, he's saying, look, you have born, you, you have put on, you, you have this imagery that you exist in right now. That's proof positive, Paul is saying, that you and I will also bear a different embodiment. Because again, this is all about being embodied. It's not about being a disembodied spirit going up there, you know, to heaven somewhere. And as many of us know, and, uh, staying on the beatific vision as the Catholics would teach somebody. No, 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 it's not about that at all. This is about embodiment. It's about changing from one species to another. I've often used the characterization because it's nothing different that we're not used to seeing. You know, tadpoles to frogs, what's that all about? It's about a metamorphosis, it's about a change. It's about, you know, larva into butterfly. 
flies. I mean, it's all around us, this metamorphosis of changing the, the contour or the condition of a, of, a, of a material of sort. You know, you take water, you heat it up, and you create steam. It's a, it's a metamorphosis of, of material changing through a process. Well, you and I are in a process. We're in the process we call conversion. It's contained in a program that we're led and understood to believe is called salvation, redemption. And that's what God is doing. He's redeeming a broken creation and making it good so that it can enjoy the realities that he has and that he lives in and exists in, in his dimension of spirituality. And when I say spirituality, again, I'm not just talking about being spiritual in your mind and in your thought and prioritizing certain characteristics and virtues. No, no, no. I'm talking literally about existing in a spiritual dimension, a different matrix of sort, if I can use the modern vernacular, of, of existing alongside beings that right now to us are invisible, but in the future will become visible. And we'll get to meet, who knows, how many different angels that maybe even interacted in our life when we were physical and get to meet them by name. That's going to be a whole different existence. It's going to be a whole different time. This Feast of Tabernacles is about, brethren, rejoicing about the reality to come. It's about being happy about the destiny by which is for you to be able to obtain. And so never to get tired, to aspire and go through what you've got to go through in order to be, make sure that you're there. And Paul here is sharing a little peek, just a little, little peek of that reality to us, hoping that we'll be motivated, that we'll be engaged, that we'll be sparked and infused with the energy, uh, the patience, the long suffering, as we're told in the, in the, the virtues and, and in the fruits of the spirit there in Galatians chapter five, uh, to do this because God is offering it to us. He's saying it's yours to have. All you've got to do is follow the footsteps of my son, my firstborn, Jesus and you'll do fine. And that's what Paul here is telling us, what fineness is ours to obtain and have in the future. And here in verse, again, going back to uh, 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. Verse 49 now, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bear, and it bears repeating, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. And then Paul shifts and he says, look, now this I say, brethren, and here, th this is so clear. And this is why I say, there's no doubt in my mind that you and I are going to have to change into something other than flesh and blood. We're told right here very clearly, Paul could not be any more plainer that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he makes that clear here in verse 50. This I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So whatever you and I are going to become, this species that, that Jesus identified as spirit beings, as a spirit being, basically, is non-corruptible. And furthermore, Paul even takes a step further now as he unravels, unfolds, discloses, adds light to a mystery. Notice in verse 51, behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. What uh, we shall not all sleep, and you know and I know that's just a polite word of saying we're not all going to remain dead, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And that's what this piece is all about. It's about, of course, the kingdom of God. Yes, it is about temporary tabernacles that we're just pilgrims passing through and that we should be able and be willing to, to obtain an attitude toward this life in terms of priority to realize that, you know what, there's nothing in this life that's worth allowing it to separate us from this from this prize of which Christ, this reward that he brings back with him. And yes, there's a lot of enriched layered meanings in the Feast of Tabernacles, but if 
as I said before at the outset of the presentation, there's one, one underlying theme about the feast. Brethren, it's about total liberation liberation into the family of God, freedom and emancipation to be embraced into the dimension of spirituality, into the arms, figuratively speaking, of our Father. And maybe in some cases, even literally, as we have opportunity to share time and space in his dimension once we, once we make it. But here, Paul continues on in verse 53, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And look at this. This says it all. This mortal must put on immortality. Yours and my destiny are to become immortals. We are destined to become born again immortals, to be given opportunity to coexist with God the Father and Jesus Christ in a warm up round called the millennium. And I always like to remind us of that because the millennium is just the beginning, it's the warm up period. Once we get beyond, brethren, the second resurrection, once we get beyond the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, Katie, bar the door, who knows what God has in store for us on the other side of what we see at the end of the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, because that is when real immortality, real life eternal or eternal life begins. But Paul makes it clear and he says here, you must put on immortality so that when this corruptible shall have put on uh, incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written that our last enemy, as Paul says uh, in, in other verses, he says, death will be swallowed up in victory. And that's where liberation comes full circle into, I believe, a real enriching meaning or definition. Because you and I right now, we're in bondage. Like it or not, e even if we're living a perfect life, I, I don't care, we have perfect health. We're, we're in just in a perfect situation. You know, we've got all of our physical needs satisfied. The fact of it is, we're still in bondage. Like it or not, we're still gonna die. We're still gonna be discontinued for a while. With the Bible, Jesus characterized it as sleep. But my point is that we are in bondage to death. And until death is swallowed up in immortality, until death is really conquered, as we are pointed out here in chapter 15 of the book of Corinthians, we still are not liberated. The true liberation comes from this situation that Paul describes when he said, death is swallowed up in victory, Verse 55, O death, where's your sting? O grave, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin uh, is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is the one who does indeed have the empowerment over death. We're told that in John, I think it is uh, chapter five, where he talks about, you know, the time when he will come back. He's been empowered by the father to raise the dead. And those that are in the graves will hear his voice and be raised at that time. He says in verse 58, closing this chapter out. So therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And our labor is not, brethren, because these promises are clear throughout your Bible, without a doubt. Over here in 2 Corinthians, just real quickly here, I wanted to kind of tie this in because I think it's important for all of us to recognize that, uh, yes, we've got some resistance. We're, we're, we're involved in some forces that really do want to hide a lot of this truth from us so that we don't have the embedded motivation through the vision that we understand is true to keep keeping on. And here, the apostle, again, writing his second letter to the Corinthian church in chapter four of Second Corinthians, we read this. Uh, breaking into the context now for the sake of time here, uh, verse three, uh, I'll break in here. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And you know it as well as I do. There's what, over two billion traditional people, human beings, traditional Christians who claim the name of Jesus Christ, billions of them, 
more than two, two billion. I think of some, the last number I heard was about two and a half billion human beings identify with the name Jesus Christ as the son of God. And yet I know it sounds bold. Nevertheless, it is true because we know, at least I assume many of you here with me today, recognize the fact that they don't understand a lot of the details. Oh, they got, they've got some of them down pat and I'm not criticizing, don't get me wrong. But what I am saying is it is a fact of, of, of reality that they do not in many cases understand what the real reward that we're talking about is. So many of them just think that they're gonna die and they're going to heaven, you know, as I mentioned before, and I don't wanna digress on that. The fact of it is though, that this gospel is hid. It is hid by the God of this world, as Paul points out here in verse four, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, not my sake. I'm not preaching for my sake. I'm not preaching for and on behalf of the Church of God International. I'm sharing this time with you this afternoon where I'm at, where you're at, you're listening to my voice, for the sake of sharing in this wonderful good news, good news, news about your future and my priceless future, our destiny and the truth that really underscores and underpins this gospel message. And this is only one segment of the gospel. I mean, we can talk about the kingdom of God being another segment of the gospel. We can talk about Christ crucified, which is another segment of the gospel. All of these segments, all of these little nuances are enrichments that layer down into this gospel message from Genesis to Revelation. And today, in sharing this one little segment through this peak hole that we're looking at, the apostle continues and he says, so beware, be, be alert to this. This is an actuality. This is a reality that we who have had our eyes opened to understand some of this, nevertheless, now can look out and recognize the God of this world has indeed, has indeed, like it or not, has indeed blinded literally billions of people to the truth of what you and I are talking about today in these few minutes we're sharing. He goes on and he says here in verse six, uh, chapter four, second Corinthians, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This is a cool comparison now. He, he goes on, he says, Paul does. We have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of the knowledge of this gospel in these earthen vessels, in our physical brains, between our ears. We, we are comprehending the spiritual magnitude, the spiritual saga, the spiritual story of, of what we're, we're involved with, you and me. At, the, at this time in our lives, I don't know how old you are, I don't know where you are, I know how old I am and I know where I am, but wherever we are, we're, we're sharing this and this is a reality, this is an actuality to all of us. And he's saying in this particular case, we have this treasure in our earthen vessels. And he goes on and he says uh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not in us. It's a, it's a, it's a testament to the empowerment of God in us via his Holy Spirit, which we're impregnated by. And the tapestry of this whole thing about being impregnated with the Spirit and being then nurtured in the womb of the church until the birthing process occurs and then overlaying that on the physical institution of marriage and the impregnation of females and bringing forth children on the physical level as it portrays what God is doing on the spiritual. I mean, all of that is very uniquely understood in your mind's eye and my mind's eye, but I submit to you, brethren, sadly, it's not shared, not shared in the depth of understanding that many of you have, and God be praised that he's opened up your eyes to be able to comprehend some of these deep, rich truths that you and I are sharing today. Paul goes on though, I digress. He says, we are troubled on every side, and we are, yet not distressed. Keep it in perspective, he says. He goes on, we are perplexed, ah, but not despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. 
regardless of what's going on. It doesn't matter what the CCP virus is doing to our lifestyle. It doesn't matter what limitations we're experiencing due to this, that, or the other thing in our life uh, as it unfolds in whatever circumstances that we might be contending with. It doesn't matter. Because even though we may be stressed, even though we may be filled with anxiety, guess what? We're not giving up on any of this. Why? Because of what we're talking about. These, this is the vision we should hold deep in our hearts so that nothing can separate us, nothing from Jesus Christ and the rewards by which he has offered through the Father to us and to bring many more sons and daughters on, into the family. Verse 10, he says, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. In other words, look through that image, look through that perspective, have that frame of mind of you as a Christian always and recognizing live like Jesus, think like Jesus, feel like Jesus as much and as best as you can. And that's why it's important that we do indeed discipline because we're disciples. We discipline our lives so that we can become greater uh, Christians for the glory of God as we reflect his attributes and virtues. Drop down to verse 15 real quick for time. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. We should be reciprocating with each other. We should be uh, uh, helping each other and building each other, iron sharpening iron, so that the abounding may glorify God in all of our lives. I'm hoping that perhaps a few words that I'm squirting out of my mouth might help you to, to be more motivated in your Christian life. As I yap here with my, my jaw and try to put some sentences together, uh, we, we hope that it would be reciprocal and, and in our conversation afterwards in the Q&A that we're going to have here in a few minutes, uh, that we would build on each other and, and help each other to be even stronger, more resilient, more confirmed, more committed, more dedicated in all that we do for the glory of God. Verse 16, he goes on here and he says, for which cause we faint not, but Though our outward man perish, and we're, we're dying every minute goes by, we're in a process of uh, degradation, you know, we're, we're corrupting, we're, we're, we're falling down, we're getting closer to death. I'm, I'm closer to death today than I was yesterday. Uh, but at any rate, that's the point that he's making here. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we mark or look, it's the word mark, that's the Greek word, it means mark, not at the things which are seen. No, 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 no. Don't get fixated. Don't get obsessed. Don't get distracted by the physical things around you. Watch out how, how many Maseratis you're buying, how many steaks you're eating, if indeed that's where you live in the world, or well, maybe where you're going to find your next meal, or you're obsessing over how you're going to pay the next. Watch out. Watch out, he says here. Keep these things in perspective, he says, because we don't look on those things which we see, but at the things which are not seen. That's the vision, that's our target. That's what motivates us. The things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, they're far more important, brethren. Why? They're eternal. They're in that dimension we've been talking about, I've been alluding to, I've been referencing this spirituality, this other matrix where things don't corrupt. They, 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 they're not finite. They're infinite. Uh, they're, they're beings, spirit beings, angels and cherubs and God the Father and Jesus Christ is at his right hand. It's a whole different reality that awaits you and I on the other side of that threshold. Chapter 5, it just continues on with this association of of basically desiring to be clothed in a different house, talking about, again, a different material. This is the tabernacle we're in, and the association of this Feast of Tabernacles being connected to the tabernacling of the physical is so very appropriate because it's all about the embodiment of getting out from here to 
what Christ characterized as the wind, that spiritual embodiment that awaits us on the other side when he returns and God, God willing, calls your name and my name to meet him in the air. And if you're alive in the twinkling of an eye, be changed in this metamorphosis, as I said before, like larva to a butterfly or like a tadpole to a frog, you will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Meet him in the air. And as Zechariah 14 says there and describes where he's landing on the Mount of Olives, he's not taking us back to heaven. There's no such thing as a, as a rapture going back to heaven for three years, three and a half, or seven years, depending on your perspective of that. No, 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 no. You're going to land. He's coming back a second time, and he is not taking prisoners. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, set up world ruling government, reestablish the government of God with yours and my help and cover this planet like the sea covers the seabeds and bring those human beings who survive the tribulations, physical human beings, into the reality of his government and set up a kingdom of Israel made of physical human beings. One of the very first events, major event, is going to be a, a grandiose, enormous exodus that's going to shrink the first exodus into insignificance, we're told in some of the books of the prophets. It's going to be such a big exodus of collecting people from the modern-day Israeli countries and the Jews and so forth back to Israel to commence a new nation a brand new nation that the Gentiles are going to look to as an example nation of what God wants them now to be like. And you and I being dispatched out to be managers of this great, great government that's going to be reinstituted on this planet as empowered spirit beings to help, to nurture, to lead as servant elders, not dictators, not autocrats exercising draconian policies upon the people to keep them under our thumbs. No, 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 no. That's, that's not it. It's going to be nurturing. It's going to be helpful. It's going to be long-suffering, patiently teaching people who, like in India, worship different animals. Uh, in other parts of the world, claim other gods are God. You know them as well as I do, be they Hindus and Buddhists, be they Muslims. All these people are going to all have to be retrained because we know there is no other name by which man can be saved other than Jesus the Christ. And praise God, brethren, your eyes and my eyes, they've been opened now so that we can begin to undertake this conversion process, this metamorphosis that we're involved with, that ultimately will conclude with a birthing event that's going to change you into a different embodiment to provide you the empowerment necessary to help our Lord and Savior rule and reign on this planet. And we will serve under him as kings and priests. Glorious destiny, everybody. It really is. And I just want to thank all of you for allowing me to share that with you because it was uh, really heavy on my heart this year. And I'm, I'm going to share this message in other areas as well because it's, uh, it's an exciting message, a really exciting message. And I'm happy for you as I'm happy for myself because we are involved in a priceless process. We really, really are. And I hope all of us do take time, not just during the Feast of Tabernacles, although this is a time to do it for sure, but also throughout the year too. You refresh yourself once in a while. Go back and revisit some of your, your purpose, your reason for, for doing what you're doing so that you have the perspective always of knowing full well the price is well worth the payment. Have a great Feast of Tabernacles, everybody, and thanks a lot for allowing me to have this, uh, this time. So I'll Flip it back here to uh, Skip and um, trust that uh, I guess you'll moderate the uh, questions and answers if I have any. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, very good, Bill. That was uh, that was a good review for some and a good uh, another way to look at things. Or, or anyway, I'll, I'll hush. Uh, we'll open it right now for <clears throat> comments or questions, and we had no time limit. Bill might, but we, no, I'm good. <laughs> we we we, uh, we don't. Last night we went for three hours. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're a talkative group sometimes, Bill. 
Uh, yeah. So uh, now we, I'll be Michael and I will be watching the chat. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions or or comments? It, it always starts slow, as you well know, Bill. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll pop up an amen to your your uh, your uh, your message for us, uh, Bill. Really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Just a, a comment, and then we can have a, a good conversation about this because it is exciting, and I can hear the excitement in your voice. And one of the words you used in your message that I really, really keyed in on was when you use that word liberation. And most of the time, because we're flesh, when those of us in the Church of God have been around for a long time, when we think of liberation, our minds automatically seem to default to, I can't wait to shed this decrepit, old, achy, painful body for the spirit body that all of us are looking forward to. But the other thing you mentioned in terms of the blindness, I put the word liberation you use and the term blindness together in a way that is, is I think, really important for us to keep in mind. Uh, because as we know, we're looking at this world, it is blind, it is full of blindness. And our, our Father in heaven, that is a mercy that the Father is extending to the rest of the world that has not been called. And we get angry. I, I'm, well, Prasad uh, lost his electricity, so he's not with us at the moment. But you know, when you look at people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, who've never heard of, of, of the God of, of Scripture, and it is a mercy that our Father extends to the world that they're blinded at this time because then there's no judgment imparted to them but that you and i being called now it is a tremendous thing to think about because the judgment is on us now at this moment we've been blessed yes. with the Holy spirit to have that as you put it so elo uh, eloquently to put on the mind and the heart to think like jesus christ does so that we can not only be transformed now but so we can be shaped in the instruments he decides he wants us to be to be utilized for the purpose of bringing in that even greater harvest. Skip came up with a number. I have no reason to dispute it uh, at, at the great white throne judgment at the, the last great day. And I'll talk about that on the last great day is 70 billion. I don't, know, I don't know where you got that number, Skip, but it sounds like a good number. And we're all <laughs> going to have a role to play in that. Uh, and it, it's just tremendous uh, that being liberated not only from the lies of Satan, but being limited, uh, liberated from the limitations of this flesh, it just all goes wonderfully together. And uh, I appreciate your message. And that's what I got out of your message when you were speaking. Oh, oh well, thank you. Yeah, I am. I can't do anything but say amen to all that you just mentioned because uh, uh, it's so true that um, uh, the world itself, uh, you know, is truly. I believe to your point that I think you made in passing. Uh, I believe a, a truly uh, how can you say this, um, deep appreciation of how merciful God is because of so much evil that has been done in ignorance and sadly in the control of mankind and human nature, and yet God is still able to consider everybody will have their chance in spite of that, and, and at some point be given the opportunity to accept and or reject Jesus Christ. And I think it's a testament to God's mercy. You use the word mercy, and that's what I was trying to drive at, his mercy. He's all merciful. Now, that, Isn't that a blessing to have that knowledge? You just said that everyone's going to get their opportunity. And what a tremendous blessing, Bill, that we have, that we're not of a mindset as so many, even in Jesus's day with the Pharisees, that we're it. And if you're not in our group, that, that there's no chance for you unless you're in our club. Uh, I, and how much well, more merciful God is, it is tremendous. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, I, I mentioned this uh, last year, I think in, in Florida when I, I was down there for the feast. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was first coming into God's church back in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, late 60s actually, uh, that's when I really started searching seriously because of my life going the way it did. But nevertheless, point being, there was one thing that I, I kept coming back to. And this one thing was really what um, kind of hooked me uh, real solidly. And that was, I came to grips with understanding or at least accepting this. God's got to be fair. There's got to be fairness with God. 
And I was led to believe that the only name by which salvation could be achieved is and or used is Jesus Christ. So I'm thinking to myself, well, so, you know, how, how do all these Hindus, how do all these Buddhists and Hare Krishna folk, how are they going to get into the kingdom of God? They don't believe in Jesus Christ. And, and the proverbial, you know, as Ron Dart used to say, the proverbial uh, missionary on his way to the hut there in the rainforest and the guy wants to accept Jesus, but he gets a flat tire, the missionary does on the way and the guy in the hut dies. And so now he's consigned to eternal hell for all eternity. Now, you know, so I'm thinking in my mind, how, how in the world is God going to ferret through all this and, and sort through all of this? And when I learned the second resurrection and understood how God is going to ferret all of this and how God is indeed going to level the playing field for everybody in that respect, to give them that opportunity that they never had. Because they, they didn't, they did, I mean, we're not talking second chance. We're talking people about never had the chance. Boy, I'll tell you what, I just had a eureka moment when I, when I came to grips with understanding how the fairness of God and his mercy is executed. And uh, I thank him and praise him for the understanding of that through the holy days, especially. Yep. <clears throat> Bill, you mentioned the word fairness just now. Blake Silverstein, who's part of our group, um, he's, I don't know if he's, I don't think he's on today, but... Um, he he calls it, and I don't know if he coined the term, the fairness doctrine. And if you uh -huh. think about the last great day, it is where God makes everything fair. People who never had an opportunity to know Christ are going to be given that opportunity. Now, uh, l let me put a little PS on the on on your story about Ron's what Ron said. He had a part two to that. <laughs> he, he was talking he was talking to a gentleman one time who, who who was talking about that and Ron mentioned you know what if the uh the uh, missionary has a flat tire on the way to that that uh community and and he said that the gentleman said well i believe if they're if they're not given an opportunity to be saved they're already saved and so here's what Ron said. He said, okay, so let me get this straight. You're going to send a missionary to them so they have a chance to not be saved? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Michael mentioned the 70 billion. Um, I I've seen that number several times that the projection, and who knows, but the projection is that we've had about 70 billion, this was five or six years ago, so it's a lot more now, that we've had about 70 billion people who have been born on the earth. Now, we gotta add a few to that. What about miscarriages? What about abortions? Now, I don't, I don't have any biblical evidence, but I believe that those, once that spark of life occurred, I think we can add them into that 70 billion uh, number. But you, you, you talk about the, the, uh, the, the millennium. We, the other day when we were going, we're going through uh, Hebrews in our uh, Saturday morning Bible studies, and it's coincidental. I don't think it's so coincidental. I think the Holy Spirit led us in that direction that we were talking about Hebrews eight, nine, and 10 at the, you know, when, when the day of atonement hit. And those are so much tied into the, uh, the uh, sacrifice and so on that, that the high priest would, would do on the, the day of atonement. Well, we came up with a term, and I really liked this. I don't know who came up with it, but the term was a reset. And if you think about the millennium, and you're talking about Jesus Christ landing on the Mount of Olives and this river of life that goes forth from the throne of God, from the, the Mount of Olives for 1,000 years to purify the wasteland, the, the pollution, all of the, the things that man has and will do to the earth. Uh, and I'm not talking about global warming. I'm just talking about just... You know, we, we've messed it up. Uh, yeah. The millennium is a 1,000 year period for a reset for man. Mm -hmm. So that 70 billion people, if we can use that number, will be raised after the millennium is over and given their first chance 
to live as a human being without Satan's influence and to learn God's way. Anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll get off my... I, 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 no, I, I agree, uh, Skip, and, and uh, to add to that imagery, uh, you know, you could also say the millennium is the platform uh, that is going to provide the, the landscape for that resurrection so that those people can have their fair opportunity. So really the millennium is the preparatory, is the preparatory um, segment, preparatory time for getting the earth reset, as you said, uh, for, for that second resurrection so that those people like my mom and my dad, they'll come up, you know, my, I've often kidded and said, when my dad sees me, he's gonna say, uh oh, I'm in the wrong place, you know, <laughs> because, but uh, I'll say, no, no, Dad, you're in the kingdom of God. Believe me, you know, <laughs> because that's what it's going to be like. I mean, they're going to be all disoriented. And, you know, who knows what era they died in, cowboys and Indians, you know, the uh, Crusades. Uh, oh, man, it's just going to be, it's going to be outrageous, quite frankly. That, but the wonderful thing, and Skip went into depth on this in a study that really resonates, at least with those of us in the group, is when you consider that the, 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 uh, the water of life, the rivers of living water, they're going to be flowing out from the temple and it gets deeper the further it goes on that that river is not constrained it's not fenced in it's not limited it, it, it will touch everyone will have access to to the river of life to the tree of life um it's not going to be guarded and blocked and at that time it's just it's going to be an amazing opportunity and we're looking forward to that time that we can be uh the instruments that god's going to use to help point uh, all mankind to that direction and mm -hmm. that's a tremendous responsibility and the other thing that i enjoy it skip brought up and you brought up you talked about justice and judgment and liberation i think it is a big relief for me to consider the fact that uh, our father in heaven and jesus christ they're the ones that are going to judge because they judge the heart and and he knows us better than we know ourselves and he's always looking uh, for us to throw away those things which are not useful to build that relationship with them that he so desperately wants and he wants that with everyone we know the scripture that says that he desires that not any flesh perish but that all come to repentance and uh, that is a very comforting thought when you think about what God's doing with all of mankind and it's not limited to just this small group here and that small group there but we have the words of life and now is a good time to be involved in our internship uh, Prasad was here. He would tell you, yes, that's why we do Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You know, we, we show, we point people, this is the direction. This is what God wants, at least to be as a yeah. witness. So, oh, Skip's got the graphic up. On his, yeah, on his yeah this, this, this is a neat, little, uh, a neat little graphic of that river of life that, 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 that leaves uh, the Mount of Olives. Uh, now, I, I'm not getting into all the details. Just look at the pictures. You can see it getting deeper and deeper, as it says in Ezekiel 47. And then the, the trees that have 12 times of fruit and, and, and all of that. And this, this river is, is going to go out. It's going to cleanse the seas. It's going to cleanse, uh, you know, uh, everything. But anyway, I just thought I would show that. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's kind of cool. Yeah, I see, I see it. Yep. Um, okay, so Barb Ellis said... Well, first, Brenda Davis said, thanks, Bill, for a great and encouraging uh, message, even on the chats. And then Barb Ellis, Barb uh, lives up north of Pocahontas. Uh, she's in our, our online group every Sabbath. Uh, she says, as, as the song goes, I love to hear the story, and I needed to hear it again, and she appreciated your, your message. Then Theta Horton, who also is a part of our group, said, me too, Barb. He's singing my song much better than I. Glory to be to God, and then uh, as Azu, I, I don't, I'm not sure how I pronounce it, Solomon. Anyway, thanks, Mr. Bill. I'm blessed to receive this wonderful message. Honestly speaking, it has answered some of my questions. And then uh, Ruth Green, Ruth and Cecil are on uh, are online with oh, us today. Okay. Uh, a wonderful, awesome. inspiring narrative of go you therefore into all the world and an encouraging reminder of our journey. Uh, but yeah, Ruth and uh, Ruth and Cecil are here. We had 30, uh, uh, correct me, uh, Erica, over 30 people uh, online with us today. And I, I have to admit that I told Michael 
and John Reedy, I said, look, there's so much, so many different places that people can go. And it's not a competition. It's not a contest. But I said, I don't know how many people are going to want to get online in the afternoon, but I think we need to, uh, you know, because we kind of have a little niche, let's do something a little bit different. Um, and uh, so I said, you know, if if we have 10 to 15 people, I will consider it a success. So it's it's a double success from from my from my numbers. <laughs> Great, great. I'm glad it was uh, oh. worth it. My only, my only correction, Skip, is there were 30 connections. That doesn't mean that there were more than yeah. one person at one of those connections. For instance, Ruth and Cecil. That's two. That's correct. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, that's that's good point. Good point. And Bobby and Sue. Oh, and Bobby and Sue. That's right. That was my wife, Diane, yeah. by the way. That, that just yeah. spoke. Up. Bobby and. Hi. Uh, Bobby and Sue Dozier were, were were on here. Wade and Nina would be, but uh, I think they're probably having computer problems unless they're at Bobby and Sue's, and I don't know if they are or not. Mm. But, um, so yeah, you're right. And and by the way, uh, it might be a little cumbersome, uh, but it would be nice to have the 251 computers that we could have online with us at the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that the limit? Is that yeah, the limit on the go to and 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 like uh 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 Erica and, and Diane said that's that's computers, you know. Right. Yep. So uh yeah like we we've had we've had connections uh when we webcast our church services uh we've had whole congregations you know uh which represent in some cases 20 24 people on one connection. Yeah. Yeah exactly you know, streaming, I, go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, yeah, just streaming is, you know, you're, you're all broadcasting it out uh, and, and a lot more people can receive it. This is interactive and the technology hasn't gotten to the point where uh, it, it can follow the same type of protocols that streaming does uh, because we're all able to be interactive here in real time. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, the blessings I, of being yeah. a, uh, together. <laughs> But the principle of connection still applies. That's not. That's what I was just making. Yeah. Point. Yeah, Bobby and Sue, your microphone was on. Did you? Do you have a? Did you have a comment or question? We saw it pop on, or you just wanted to say hi. Bobby and Sue. Oh, their microphone was on again. Hi, Bobby and Sue. They might be having. Uh, they could be having internet problems. They they live down in Monticello, Arkansas, and sometimes they do. So there might, you know, they might not be able to communicate with us. Now I know that Ruth and Cecil will uh uh Green have something to say. All right. Hey Cecil. Hi Ruth. Hello. <laughs> How are you um, feeling? I'm How are you feeling now? You feeling good? Um, I'm improving all the time. <laughs> that a girl. That a girl. Yeah, it's it's been a blessing to um we we're studying the book of Job right now and, and um <laughs> I I'm a lot better than Job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> so and the outcome for Job is wonderful, so I, I I get that impression. So, <laughs> Cecil just had to step away. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, right. he, can, well, he, can jump in when, he can jump in when he comes back. I know Theta Horton's got something to say. Okay. You know who I saw that I didn't get to say hi to? Yeah, I was just going to tell tell Ruth. Um, Job is my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, when I start feeling sorry for myself or having self-pity i read job and i know that um it could be a whole lot worse and then it also inspires me that the end story and you know we come to like you said it ends up with good news and that's always inspiring to me yes and and in in connection with the sermon 
we were doing the part where it was he says i know my redeemer liveth and that he will stand in the latter day on the earth so it was going with with um first corinthians 15 and so it just sort of um mellowed into what we were studying this morning making it all more inspiring so um i really appreciated the sermon that's awesome uh, Bible is very continuous. It, uh, it fits together like a like a big puzzle. Every every piece fits. Did you make that word up? What's that? Continuous. <laughs> that, that's in my own dictionary. I got my own dictionary. Okay. I don't know. If I, okay. I use my own words. <laughs> our daughter, uh, our younger daughter, she's really smart, but she's uh, kind of an airhead sometimes. But she and her <laughs> husband. Are you calling me an airhead? <laughs> you you don't have any now, Bill. Uh, yeah. Uh, they were coming hair. back from somewhere and John said something that, that, that she didn't like and she said uh, uh, I resent that insinuendo <laughs> which is really a great a, a great word and I've, I've got another story I'm, I'm sorry I have to throw this in about about her they've just sold their home and so they're cleaning up and packing and everything and uh, she wanted to clean her floors and, and some of the ladies, she works at a, uh, help me, Diane, a, a children's uh, medical. Pediatric clinic. Yeah, pediatric clinic. Oh, my goodness, Skip. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> you know how old I am, Diane. <laughs> so, okay. Well, why don't you tell the story? You tell it better than I do. Well, okay, I'll tell it, even though I don't like to talk online. But anyway. So they were telling her that powdered Tide and a little bleach and water is the best thing to clean your floors for. And so as she's telling me this, I'm going, oh, I don't know about that, but okay, go ahead. And then she said, well, and there's something about this keeper's friend. And I said, oh yeah, the barkeeper's friend, that, that's a good product. And she said, well, I bought the powder. And she said, I guess I didn't put enough water with it to make a good paste. So she said it was just okay. So she was telling the girls at work that it was okay. And one of the ladies said, well, you probably need to use some elbow grease. And Casey goes, oh, where do I get that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, Casey, you did not just say that. Those words did not come out of your mouth. <laughs> the blonde roots go all the way to the brain. They do. <laughs> they do. All right. I wanted to say hi to uh, Ma. Ma is online. I just looked at the bottom of my list. I had to scroll down because we've had more people here. Hey, Ma. Hey, and I'm ready, and I'm ready to talk. I saw yes. the mic go on, Vicky. I thought maybe you were. Well, I, I, I did it before Michael acknowledged me. But anyway, um, hi, Bill. It was very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. People, I am not articulate. And when I start trying to tell people the story of Christ and uh, the kingdom, I get tongue tied. And then I can't think of the right prophet that I want to quote. Uh, so I do my best online, but I don't feel like I, I'm articulate enough to try to tell people verbally how can I I pray about it I haven't overcome it yet well now remember Vicki there's some of us that have no filter and it's even worse than not being able to be articulate Vicki if I could know better that you were online, I would swear that was Sharon talking. Yeah. <laughs> You're sounding uh, more and more, they more they like her. Yeah, they sound alike. Yeah. Uh, Good to hear your voice, Vicki. Good to hear your voice. So how do you how do how how do I go about being more articulate or, or at least getting this message out? Any other suggestions or you know, brainstorming here with everybody and how they do it. And I, I send emails out and I'm sure people see my name and go delete, delete, delete. 
I think sometimes you you can use your social medias, you know, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, if you have a hard time verbalizing and you're not as quick thinking and words don't seem to flow to you, oftentimes writing is a bit more strategic and a lot less anxious, you know, for uh, uh, for people like that that uh, seem to have a more difficult time in speaking. But, uh, you know, typing, using your social mediums, sending out um, setting out uh, uh, Twitter posts and or cutting and pasting uh, individual messages from speakers that do articulate something you want to share with somebody. All of those things, I believe, are, are valid and uh, reasonable alternatives, you know, in helping yourself. My, my suggestion always with people that have uh, a tendency to be a little bit um, or uh, slower in their ability to speak is to stay on topics or try to uh, stay in the area that you're familiar with and uh, do the best you can to uh, guide the conversation in those areas that you're familiar with. Um, I know you sometimes can't control that because you, you've got to uh, be able to, um, excuse me just for a minute. Yeah. Uh, you can't control the topic oftentimes because a person just has a topic and all of a sudden, you know, you get cold, cold cocked, so to speak. But uh, if you can, and when you can, try to keep uh, it in a realm uh, that you're familiar with and to keep it as simple as you possibly can until you become more, uh, uh, more capable in, in those areas that maybe you're weaker in. Yeah, keeping it simple, the, 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 the kiss, uh, uh, keep it simple, stupid, is, is a good uh, basic way to, um, talk to anyone. Now, mine, I do it a little different, as, as many of you know. Uh, I have spread out, and I'm not talking about weight, but I've done that too. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've spread out into uh, visiting with people of other faiths. And what I have, have worked really hard for the last 20 years is to learn how to discuss the scriptures with somebody without getting into arguments and fusses and fights. So uh, I would say it's very important, at least from my perspective, to find the things that you can agree on and talk about those and emphasize those. And when, when, when I talk with someone who we don't agree on something, then, then what, what I simply do is say, well, here's the way I look at it. How do you look at it? And they say, here's the way I look at it. And then I say, okay, interesting. And we move on to the next subject. The yeah, buts is where the argument starts. Yeah, but verse 16 says, you know, so it, it's really easy, or at least has been for me, to find things that I have in common uh, with, with, other, with other Christians. Anyway. Yeah, <clears throat> this is Cecil Green from Oklahoma. And to the lady who just called, as far as uh, being a representative, we are to be salt and light. And I can hear a kindness in your voice in addition to what other people have said there's a kindness in your voice that people will respond to and uh, the spirit of god working in you and the light and the salt that uh, you are displaying is a, a tremendous a powerful voice for god just living your life in godly way and then of course with in addition to the other things you can learn those things but i can sense a kindness that would automatically make me want to listen to you because I hear the sincerity in your voice as well. That just makes me want, that's about makes me want to cry. Thank you so much. Well, he, he, he's and, never talked to Sharon, Vicki. <laughs> <He's never laughs> yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, Ma. Um, you know, each of us is blessed by God with different uh, talents and different spiritual gifts that uh, he has for us in order to be used as his instruments. We're all different. We all fit into the same body uh, uh, differently. And how God's going to use us is by the talents that he's blessed us with. He's not going to you know, put you in a situation uh, that you're not going to handle. Uh, even though we in our flesh say, well, I can't, I can't do that. I mean, come on, Ma, look what he did with me. Here, you're going to the other side of the planet. Even though you don't want to go, you're going to go. And, uh, you know, God, you've suddenly realized you've got a strength you didn't know that you had. And God will help uh, uh, develop those. Um, it's a little, don't worry so much about, uh, you know, making yourself perfect. 
just be open to what our Abba, our Father has, and he'll he'll build those things in you. But you can do exercises like uh, Bill was talking about. If you want to develop one of those talents, if you have a strength in it, so it can be utilized as a as a way to reach others and shine a light. Thank you very much, Michael. I I do recall one time years ago when I first came into the church, I was going to tell my employer that I couldn't work on the Sabbath, and they, she went up to the headquarters people, and they came back and they said, "Well, you can work on Sunday." And uh, but because of the Seventh Day Adventist text, you're going to have to work more Sundays than others would work Saturday. And I was going to say that's not fair. And I heard all these words coming in on my mouth that were kind. And I was telling the director, thank you very much. She worked it out for me. These were not my words. I heard myself saying them, but they weren't coming from my mind. But it, it, I've never had that happen ever since. But I do remember it well. Yeah, and um, because of the virus and we had death in our family from that and our, our family started a, a streaming go meet um, thing where we greet each other every morning and we have people who are sick and and sometimes I wake up with something on my mind, a song or some inspiration from um, uh, you know, some something that I might have studied and I share it with them and they go, oh, that was the perfect thing. I, I'll go and, and download a song for someone to that they can listen to. But um, we, we can do that for people that like, um, I guess we're on Facebook with and they're um, distressed and you can send them something like that. And I find, especially with music, that it, it seems to be just what God wants them to have at that time. So it was a way to um, do that. And, and in, in that, a lot of our young um, people, my nieces and nephews and, and even children who grew up in the church, but they are not in the church anymore, they're making roads back to God. With, here, with our... You know, Ruth, you you uh, you just kind of brought up something uh, to me. As, as bad as COVID nineteen is, and how it's shut down so many so many churches, and whether they you know agree with with what we do or not, it seems to me, based on the numbers that I have heard, I'm not sure that m more people are not hearing about Jesus Christ. Now they may not hear the same way we teach, and so on. But I'm not sure more people aren't hearing now, hearing now than were going to church before. Uh, now, an, another thing that was interesting uh, is we had a tornado here back not long after the virus shut everything down. And it hit uh, one large restaurant here that would have had about 150 people in it. Because of the corona, because of COVID nineteen, there wasn't anybody in it. Maybe a few employees, but nobody was hurt. Our mall got hit. It was on a Saturday afternoon. Think about how many people would be in a mall, even in Jonesboro, Arkansas, of seventy thousand people. There would have been a thousand people in there. Nobody much was in there. Um, and so it was a blessing, as crazy as it sounds, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, that we'd been shut down. Otherwise, we probably would have had four or five hundred people killed. Just, just a little tidbit, you know. God did bless us, no doubt. I I appreciate what uh, what, what uh, Ruth and Cecil and. Uh... <laughs> what Ma was saying as far as uh, the things that they'd like to uh, be used as an instrument in order to help other people. And I uh, wanted to touch based on something you mentioned, Skip, about all these other groups that you meet with. Um, you know, we have to get out of the classroom of our understanding because some of us have been in the Church of God for decades and decades. And it's time for us to get out of the, 
classroom and into the internship uh, of the work that we have to do. Because if we believe we're going to be kings and priests in the world tomorrow, uh, the time to show people that this is the way, walk in it, is, is now. This is a good way to develop those skills and those fruits. And and one of the things that I think is important to skip trigger the thought is uh, is being able to stand on a bridge of commonality. Even if you have even sometimes major disagreements, if you're willing to stand on the bridge of Christ and him crucified, it is amazing what you can accomplish together, even if you disagree on, on major doctrines. And a case in point to, to make that point is our founding fathers of this country. They were of different denominational uh, backgrounds and they had a lot of feuding between them. I know the Congregationalists had uh, uh, issues with the uh, uh, with, with the other groups, the, the Puritans and the uh, Methodists, and they were all constantly fighting, but they were willing to stand on a common foundation of Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible, and the uh, justice of Scripture, uh, and put aside all those other differences to stand on a common foundation to forge uh, a nation built upon the basic precepts of, of Scripture, and that's what our society was built on. And sadly, with all the arguing that's been going on, you know, in the you know two centuries since, We've gotten to the point now where we, we've completely thrown the baby out with the bathwater and all the garbage taking place around the world is a result of people that are uh, unwilling to be able to listen to one another, at least work on what they have in, in common anymore. And I'm beginning to wonder whether or not the American people have much in, in common with those things that once established justice in, the, in this country. So I think your, your, your point, Skip, I think is a valid one to keep in mind as we are in a world filled with blindness. And we're going to be that that blindness that blindness is going to be liberated uh, into the truth someday. And I guess it's a good thought taking Bill's sermon into mind that we uh, be mindful that, that we can build more uh, if we're willing to stand on a bridge of commonality than tear one another down because we don't agree exactly uh, the same way about every little thing. And yeah. I say that as it's guilty of it. You know, doing uh, that. Michael Michael knows this, but. Um... It, with with the group that I meet with on on Wednesday mornings, uh, I meet with uh, have a Bible study with I don't know there's anywhere from fifteen to twenty, uh, most of them are Baptists, um, and they have asked me on two different occasions, two different years, to explain to them uh, why we observe the holy days and what do they. What do they mean? And they were interested and they've listened. Uh, and uh, Wednesday morning, this Wednesday, day after tomorrow, I'm taking my laptop and my projector and I'm, I'm going to make a, a presentation or do a Bible study on the tabernacle in, in, the, uh, in the wilderness and all of, all the different pieces and some of the things that the high priest did and, and all of that, you know, they've invited me to, to come do that. Cause I was talking to him about the day of atonement and, you know, cause that was what Monday last Monday. And uh, uh, so anyway, you, you know, there, there are areas of commonality and, you know, they may walk out of there and, and say, you know, well, I didn't believe anything skips. That's okay. They heard it. And we didn't fuss and we didn't fight. But anyway, that's just, that's that's me. Uh, I have, uh, instead of being the jerk that I was when, uh, you know, when I threw Diane's Christmas tree out the door three different times and burned up the stockings and almost caused a divorce, uh, I've, I've learned a little bit about how to not be such a jerk. And I know some of you would not agree with that. <laughs> Hi, Chrissy. Hey, I I wanted to say that um, a, a lot of people have a lot of TV time or online time now, and I have been amazed by how many national syndicated uh, faith uh, pe people of faith, you know, have programs. How many programs? Um, are uh, explaining, at least to some degree, um, the different feast days. And it's becoming a pretty big thing. I mean, main, mainstream people, uh, names out there, are talking about it to their people. And 
it's it's something we would have never imagined 50 years ago or 20 years ago and I find that very encouraging that people are opening up their eyes to the holy days and a lot of them some some of them uh, celebrate it maybe not observe it you know like feel like they have to do it but I mean big names see CBN has a Feast of Tabernacles special they had one for some of the other holy days um, uh, Paula White uh, is doing a whole series on that uh, the Hebrew roots kind of people who are on TV you know the Jewish angle um there's several shows with that they're covering the holy days of course i mean you would expect that but i mean big you know mainstream people are covering that so people are really you know getting to know this since they're not in their uh own little world uh on sunday you know and then that's it for them they're looking up on things online you know watching it and um i I feel like there may be people who may be looking soon for a place that actually celebrates these things. It's it's not going to be completely foreign to a lot of Christians in, in, in just a year or so. Yeah, I think a lot of people find them um, interesting. I know John Hagee has uh, bumped up on them occasionally and... Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Baker, Jim, Jim Baker's had uh, the, the uh, um, I don't know if uh, Khan, uh, the uh, fella, I forget his first name. I think it's Khan. He wrote a few books. Uh, he's been on his show on occasion and he's brought up the holy days to Jim Baker and his program. So I think to your point, yeah, they, they're getting, the, the holy days are getting some uh, press and getting some uh, interest uh, but not, I, I, they're getting just that. There's not a lot of Sunday keepers, I don't think, that are really coming around though to observe or keep them. But to your point, it very well may be eventually that if they keep talking about it, some are going to start saying, you know what, I think we ought to start looking around to see how to celebrate these things, you know. Yeah, that's a good point, Bill. It's, it's something, you know, most of us, uh, you know, see the internet as a big negative because of all the negative things and the way social media operates. However, at the same time, it could be a blessing because people are no longer limited to the uh, what their traditions of their particular group are teaching. With the internet, mm -hmm. they, they can stumble upon or find and look for themselves uh, mm -hmm. information about, well, why are we doing this thing? My church says this and these group people here are saying this they have a bigger opportunity to uh, find out for themselves uh, because a lot more information uh, is at our fingertips than it was right. uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so that's something that uh, has been a blessing. There are, um, there, there's some uh, uh, chats here. Uh, Gene Ellis says hello to everyone. Uh, Nikki H gave some information about the Declaration of Independence, uh, which is cited from the text. And then Gene Ellis says to all, or to Skip, by the way, Skip, if you ever give a seminar on how not to be a jerk, he would be interested. Oh, uh -huh. I could do a good one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Skip, it had to be a two part. <laughs> at least, at least. Uh, thanks, John. I needed that. <laughs> Here is, uh, here's a picture of me talking to St. Peter 20 years ago. And of course, it's a joke because I'm not going to be talking to St. Peter at the gates. But anyway, yeah, you were a believer, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. And, and I like that you used your name. Like... <laughs> Do what? I like that because he used your name, skipped it. That's true. That is true. Good point. Good point. Well, Diane will, will tell you how wonderful it was to live with me the first uh, several years of our <laughs> of our marriage. Anyway. You know, the truth of the matter is I didn't bring a single person closer into a relationship with Jesus Christ by beating them over the head with the scriptures because I was right and they were wrong. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't do that. 
I, I found out showing people this is the way, walk in it, uh, it, it as an invitation. I mean, Jesus Christ didn't beat people over the heads with the truth. He beat the, the, the money changers out of the temple twice, but that was a whole different uh, a circumstance. Um, so, you know, you live and learn as human beings, we get so excited about, you know, what we understand is the truth that we want to, we want to just get it out and make sure everybody slap everybody upside. Down. How come you don't see this? It's in black and white right there. The seventh day, it's right there in black and white. Why aren't you doing it? And, uh, you know, we forget one thing is that, uh, God has not opened their minds to see what you see. Yeah, we have to have patience that uh, it's going to take God to open up their minds. It's going to take that. That's why it's going to take a thousand years for us to get the earth ready uh, with those rivers of living water to be able to have their minds open. Uh, so we can be a lot more patient than uh, with our brothers and sisters that are not in the faith. So we don't have to beat them over the head with the truth because they, they don't get it. And we do. I have a really good friend. Uh, we're really close who is an atheist. And uh, we, we kind of avoid, you know, the, the subject of religion most of the time. But um, he made a comment to me one time. He lives in Houston. We were on the phone and, and uh, he said, you know, and he, he didn't say it in a bad way. He just said, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know, Skip, that you have me off burning in hell forever because I don't believe in God. And I said, no, Mike. I believe that we're going to be in the kingdom of God together and we're going to be playing guitars and singing and having a big old time. And it was just a pregnant silence. I mean, he didn't, he didn't know what to say. He'd never heard that before because his wife grew up church of Christ. He grew up Baptist. And, and, you know, as you all know, traditional Christianity teaches that, um, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ right now today, uh, before you die in this lifetime, it's over, and you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And that's what Mike had been taught, and that's what he believed all Christians believed. And and when I, I said, and I didn't get any details about uh, the last great day or anything, I just said, that is not what we believe, and that's not what the Bible teaches uh, as far as as, as I know. I mean, the way I understand it, it's not the way the Bible teaches. But I said, no, Mike, you're not you're not going to go and, and, and burn. And I, I said, I know you don't even believe that there is a hell, but we don't believe that. And it just shocked him to the core. Yeah, my uncle, he was a uh, Baptist a deacon in the Baptist church. And I remember when I was first getting involved with God's church and I had just started attending Worldwide Church of God back in 1971, 72. And uh, he knew I was involved with Herbert W. Armstrong, Ambassador College, Worldwide Church of God. That's what the nomenclatures that he recognized it. He was familiar with it. So every time I would go and visit him or go over there, he'd immediately say, Billy, this is not the age of the law. This is the age of grace, you know. Sure. And uh, we get into it right off, off the start. But I'll never forget this one discussion we had uh, whereby I said, okay, well, Uncle Steve, his name was Steve. I said, Uncle Steve, tell me this. How, how are all the, if Jesus is the only one name that you could be saved by, how are all these Hindus and Buddhists and Baptists or the little kid who's five years old get run over by a car, never had a chance to accept Jesus into his heart, how are they all going to be saved? And his answer, his answer was, God will just automatically save them. That was his answer. Unless there was a, minute, a a missionary on the way there to save him, and he, he died, he died early. <laughs> I wasn't that witty yet. <laughs> I, couldn't I, I had a similar conversation with somebody, and I can't remember what faith they were. And I asked that same question, Bill, and I her response was, "They won't be saved." Oh, oh, she's hardcore. <laughs> yeah I, I was like that's that's really disheartening and sad really yeah that is <laughs> you know um we we teach very very vociferously if you will 
that you're not saved by works. Uh, what we teach is that we're saved by the grace of God, uh, faith in Jesus Christ, and then at, at that point we begin to repent or we repent and uh, you know we obey God as, as best we can. And that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, what we teach. And uh, uh, if you know what my wife says about me, that if I didn't make my introduction so long, I wouldn't forget what I was going to say. That was a long introduction, folks. I have no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> Hi, Doris. Hello, Doris. Your microphone's on. Do you have a comment? Uh, Ruth, Ruth Green uh, chatted, uh, Christ used the scourge to drive out oxen and sheep not the money changers. Okay, that's that's an interesting, uh, um, I had not heard the specifics of that, but uh, I, I will take your word for that. Well, but, but, but he, he shut down what they were doing. That was, it was not a good thing, uh, no. what they were doing. He was very angry about that. Uh, so, and, so were they. Right. They were, they were yeah, angry about money. Yeah, the ruckus that he created. Uh, Cecil Green here. I just wanted to comment on what you all were discussing. Uh, there's a story about John Wycliffe. He wanted to get the Bible in everyone's hand because some of the ministers of that time were not teaching the people what was in the Bible. And uh, there was a young couple and the young man's wife was uh, had had a nervous breakdown because what had happened, they had to save up enough money to get their newborn child baptized. And as they were working to save up the money, the child died. And the priest in that area told the wife that her child was burning forever and ever because they did not have the uh, money. He was not baptized before he died. And John Wycliffe said, oh, that generation of vipers. He said he wished he could have the Bible in everyone's hands so they could read it for themselves. That's not what the Bible says. So I think it's interesting that that uh, some people have that concept that if a child dies without being baptized, that uh, he's burning forever and ever, and he never had a choice. But uh, the Bible uh, states differently, and I think that's great that we can uh, give people the truth. As Bill was mentioning about what happens after a person dies, he has an opportunity to be resurrected and be given a new body, and that will uh, be discussed, I'm sure, later on in the feast about the last great day, et cetera. Well, I just remembered what I forgot. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we teach that you're not saved by works, but I've, I've got a friend, he passed away. Uh, we weren't real close, but you know, we, we were friends. And he was a, uh, an elder in, in, in another church group, a traditional Christian church group. And he had a debilitating lung disease. And I don't remember which one it was, where he was in the hospital for a long time before he died, two or three months before he died. And for that entire month, he fretted that he had not done enough to be in God's kingdom, to be go to heaven or whatever it was that he that he believed. And I, you know, I. I I, I felt so bad for him because you couldn't couldn't talk him out of it. I mean, it's just what he believed. He had not done enough. And, you know, I was talking to a, a friend who, who was aware of that and, and was trying to tell him that, you know, you have. I mean, you, you can't do it by works anyway. But um, and, uh you know, it, 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 it was just a sad, sad, sad situation that he, you know, uh, felt that he wasn't going to be in God's kingdom. And, and so, you know, his, his death brought about peace, sleep. He will be sleeping until uh, his turn, whatever, you know, whenever that mm -hmm. is. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's such a shame. And we've got our son-in-law's well, I don't want to name any, any, all that, but he is 
or used to be, I don't know if he still is, tormented because Granny was going to hell. You know, and I, it, it's, it's such a shame that we, we have people who, who fear that kind of stuff. And yeah, uh, that's a horrible teaching it really yeah. is. When you think about it and you think it through, it's, it's a very horrible, brutal, uh, macabre, very macabre teaching to think that a loving God, uh, would find or not even find, let's just leave it at this would allow Satan to operate a place like that under his allowance to torture humankind for all eternity. I mean, it's just a macabre doctrine. It, yeah. it does, it, it's senseless. It's interesting is it's not a doctrine that's limited to Christianity. You know, we know it was borrowed from right. Hagen. And yep. one of the interesting things is, is having been called to do mission work on the other side of the planet is, you know, I was raised, you know, uh, church wise. Uh, my formative education was in the Worldwide Church of God. So when God plucks me down in India and Chitty sits me down in front of the, the Hindus there, uh, I'm here to preach the gospel. And the only thing I understood is I'm looking at all these Hindus is to preach against the, the Sabbath. I mean, to preach against Sunday keeping Christmas and Easter. I had no idea what to say to, to them. And I remembered what Paul went through in Athens. Uh, and that was a, that was a big help, um, you know, and it, our, our gospel is, it is not against other Christians. Uh, the gospel is the truth of what Jesus Christ has presented. And I felt at a big disadvantage uh, early on when we began the Indian ministry that, uh, you know, was limited to basically arguing with other Christians about what they understood as the doctrine. And granted, those doctrines are heinous. And then it was a very big surprise to learn that that same doctrine is something that actually motivates much of the Indian mindset. Because uh, despite the fact that they're pagans and they have 300 million official government sanctioned deities that they worship, 300 million gods, um, that they, they're all looking for eternal life. There's no atheism in India. And uh, one of the things that really attracts a lot of the low caste and uh, the widows is because they believe that they're suffering the miseries of their life because they've sinned and they have to pay the penance in this life until they're reincarnated over and over to reach perfection. And uh, they never heard, this is what attracts the people in India to say that Jesus Christ already paid the penalty for your sin. Uh, his blood has covered it and you're guaranteed eternal life because of him. And that's a message that they've never heard. And that's what really attracts, their eyebrows go up when they hear that message or when yeah. you preach to the Hindus. Uh, I, and that was a big relief for them then to see the relief on their face when someone is preaching that truth to them. Michael, do you, do you know much about their uh, uh, educational system over there? Uh, Everything. The reason, the reason why I ask, you know, I, I had to memorize the, 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 the math tables and all those. Do, do you think they have to memorize the 300 million gods? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, that's no joke. Um, the public school system, everything in India, India and Islam, uh, like the, the Islamic theocracies like Iran and, and Saudi Arabia, they're very similar, except of course, India is pagan. Everything in India, all of their math, all their science, everything is done through the prism of Hinduism, everything. So Margie. there's that line that they have to unlearn what they've learned. And we're, we have it easy as Christians in the United States because when Prasad goes to preach the gospel, he has to basically start from scratch. You know, where all we have to do is basically show Christians, okay, well, this is the way walk in it. You already believe in Christ and that he died for your sins. We have an advantage here when we're presenting people the way of God more perfectly. In India, they don't even know who the creator is. So they literally, when they preach the gospel, they have to go back to square one and introduce them to the actual creator. Because in, in, in the Indian mindset, the Hindu mindset, believing in a creator that exists outside of creation, and Bill mentioned this in his sermon, it, it, it is a, it's blasphemy to them because they worship the creation. Literally, they worship the animals and all those things in there. So to hear a, a, about a God that exists outside of creation is offensive to most of the upper caste Hindus. But the aspect of sin and suffering for sin until you reach Nirvana, to, to, to tell them their sins are already forgiven, 
through Christ is a big relief for them. And that's how most of them begin accepting uh, Jesus Christ over there. Just thought I'd bring it up as this conversation has been going through that uh, through that that valley uh, that leads to the last great day. Yeah, frankly, a lot of that, uh, what you just touched on, Mike, uh, gives gives good camouflage to Satan, the devil, and his demonic machinations over there because he's able to hide in and amongst all of that confusion and uh, mis misdirection of, and misappropriation. And so uh, with them not believing in that respect, uh, like along those lines, they uh, they really become victimized, sadly, by uh, by a lot of demonic activity. Yeah, you're more right than you know. India is a land of abject darkness. It is Satan's playground, and that's what the world would look like uh, if, if, if if there was no scriptures, if there was no influence of God's people. And we really don't mm -hmm. have a clue what that's like. And that's you are exactly right. Well, you've been to the slum areas of Jamaica, so you get an idea a little bit. But yep. yeah, India takes it to a whole a whole other level. And we've been blessed in this country that you know God has brought us in contact with other people that already have a foundation in uh, at least knowing who Christ is. Um, so being able to show them this is the way more perfectly is a lot easier than what our brethren in India have to do in order to preach the gospel. Well, it's good, it's good yeah. to keep that in our prayers. Right. Thank you, Bryant wrote. Uh, thank you for sharing everyone. Yahweh blessed. Uh, Vicki said, enjoyed it so much, have to go. Thank you, Bill and Skip. She really appreciated it. And Michael. Uh, that, well, okay. <laughs> she said our, our our it guy yeah mike the it guy <laughs> i tell you what you all seriously have no idea how much that guy does uh, uh shoot uh, you just have no idea uh both at the feast and and here and you know he's he's up till one two three o'clock in the morning um uh, right now he's tr he's uh uh he's he's taking the uh the video that Prasad has sent from India and he's going through and doing the best job he can to semi-translate and, and put English subtitles in there. And, and he's, he's got about, I think he said about six more hours to go. Uh, and wow. he already, he's already worked about 12 or 15. Yeah. That's just on that presentation. Then we've got our presentation tomorrow which I still have to put the PowerPoint together for that, even though the, the, the text is done. And then I have to start on our uh, part two, but you're doing mostly part two on uh, on uh, Tuesday. So I just have an introduction and a conclusion. You've got the rest of the bulk of it. That's uh, because it was, I'm such a positive person and you're such a negative person. I have yes. to do the good part and you do the bad. Yes, that's right. <laughs> My wife will give you a thumb. Here she is, she's gonna say You it. have no idea. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm the guy that always wants to see where the bad stuff's coming from, so I don't get surprised by it when it hits, hits me upside the head. So I'm the guy on top of the wall screaming to everybody to watch out because it's about to rain. You know, that that's me. Yeah. My wife oh, would rather say you're more like Eeyore. We appreciate your labor of love. We well, sure do. I, can, I can assure you I do. By the way, I don't know if you all noticed uh the uh, out Bill's windows behind him, there are several trees. Did you notice those leaves that were kind of fluttering around? Well, that's what causes the wind. Wait a minute. I That went right over my head, Skip. Yeah, <laughs> me too, Skip. No, but... seriously, the, the leaves are fluttering, and that's what causes the wind. If you don't believe me, when you see those leaves fluttering, walk outside, you'll feel a breeze. Okay, because that's good. My my ten year old boy herself went somewhere else. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, those are real trees. That's not a green screen. I mean, that that's my backyard. Yeah, yeah, and the leaves are creating the wind back there. Yeah, I understand. No, the wind is the wind, and it's blowing the leaves. The leaves don't create the wind. Well, <laughs> it's okay. Skip believes that the the. the the sun revolves around the earth still, so we'll get <laughs> and it's flat. Yeah, no, I, I'm just going to say that. I, don't say that, Skip. <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah. Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I'm not trying to shut this off, but but w whenever I start telling uh, jokes, it it, it it has digressed far enough. Does anybody else have anything uh, uh, that you'd like to add? This has been great. Uh, I think uh, you know Bill Waterhouse has done a great job today with. <laughs> with uh... <laughs> That's elementary, my dear Watson. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and and I, I know you've been involved in all of this before, but this is the value of of go to meeting for us, Bill, to have the the, the discussions and and uh, uh, iron sharp as iron and and, and so on. Okay, uh, Ruth said after reading that scripture in several versions, it's not so clear. And when someone was claiming this as justification for beating his wife, not sure what she's talking about here. I don't either. Was that in relation to the money changers? Uh, yeah. out of the temple? Yes. Yes. Okay. There okay. was one word that says all, but otherwise the, this person was saying, yeah, Jesus beat the money changers. So when they were doing wrong, so I could beat my wife. <laughs> oh my goodness. How, oh, on earth, no. how on earth could someone come up with that? <laughs> yeah. that's what I, And when I read it, I, in in the version I read it, it didn't have all, and that it just said oxen and sheep that he used his stores to drive them out. But he turned over the the money changes. Um, yeah, yeah, all of, all of that. Yeah, but and I, that I, then I, drove the animals out. But it wasn't as clear in some of the versions. I'm not sure how they get the beating wife part. Hey, Diane, what do you think about that? Does that give me the authorization to beat you? Don't even go there, Seth. <laughs> Don't go there. She's going to give you those electricity I, out of her eyes. I dare you to try, Skip. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, it would happen one time. We've been married 48 years, and if I ever did that one time, it would not go past 48 years. <laughs> Rightly so. Yeah. yeah rightly so. Skip, Skip will be a pillar of salt. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> I've I've seen the fire out of Diane's eyes when she's upset with them, and he will be a pillar of salt uh, <laughs> up on the ground. You know, thankfully, you know, and that, you know, that was our Lord and Savior's uh he had full authority uh to do that, mm -hmm. and it was his judgment. And I'm always glad to leave those things to his judgment uh in terms of what he did. Uh, there were the money changers. And, you know, if you know the story of what scam they had going on and how they were perverting the law of God to make it a ridiculous burden while it was so corrupt, uh, it's understandable why the, the, the son of the Most High who established everything would be so angry to see how badly it was perverted uh, upon people that were willing, you know, to do what God said in full faith and have it perverted that way. So that these people could enrich themselves was just beyond the pale, and he was justified in 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 using the whips and chains to drive them out. I can understand it. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Righteous indignation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 We, uh, I'm sorry. We have to leave. Cesar and I have to leave now. Well, we've we, been both. very thank. We are thankful, and we really appreciate. It. We're good hearing you, Ruth and Cecil. Good hearing you too. You guys take care. Have a great feast. So hopefully, we'll Thank see you tonight at the Pine Ice Cream Social. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Plan I'm, to come. I've got enough ice cream for three or four more families. So if you, some of you all want to drive to Jonesboro, Arkansas, uh, you know we'll, we've got the ice cream, and we also have. And I mentioned this last night. I, Bill probably has never heard of them before, but. Our 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 uh, cake portion it's is called they're called devil dogs, and um, I don't know why they got that name, but what they are they're Hostess cupcakes on steroids. They are homemade. Oh my goodness gracious! Uh, you you eat one of them and 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 you you die of, of high blood sugar. Uh, are they cream cream filled? Cream, cream filled. filled. Chocolate icing, chocolate cake, cream filled, but they're about six inches long. Uh, and about three inches high. And oh, like an like an Inclair, like yes, like an Inclair. Yes. Sounds MB good. Wants to know has the seminar started? Uh, we're at the conclusion of the uh, service at this point. Uh, MB, 
Uh, we're, we're, we've been going for uh, two hours, well, two hours and 10 minutes officially. Uh, but we have a pie and ice cream social, social night if you would like to join us then. Yeah, and we're, we're going to all try to turn on our cameras and, and uh, see everybody and visit. And, you know, we, we don't have any kind of a, a subject or agenda or anything uh, tonight except to gorge ourselves during the feast uh, on, on ice cream, pie, cake, and, and uh, uh, great camaraderie. Uh, it's open fellowship, just as we would if we were there at LBL at the Feast, sitting around big tables, meeting everybody, talking about everything. We can hear all of Skip's lousy jokes, all That's of right. them. That's right. Now, and one one more thing, then I'm I'm through. And it, uh, I heard a term the other day, and I can't remember uh, where it was. Uh, but uh, you old timers, Bill, I know you're going to uh, appreciate this if you hadn't already heard it, but. Uh, one of the issues that we run into every one run into every once in a while is somebody has brings an ant, an ant, a n t, astounding new truth. <laughs> he, he, he meant that it, it's an acronym. Yeah, Everyone brings an ant. Uh, Bring an ant. A n t. That's right. Astounding new. Truth. Yes. Oh, you've heard yeah, those, haven't you? Bill? Head coverings and calendar dates, Bill. <laughs> that reminds me of the uh, acronym I used to use on my proposals when I was in water treatment. I would always add a line for fat, and that fat meant for added things. <laughs> yeah, for added things. Yeah, yeah. Well, but fortunately, uh, we have a right not to listen, don't we? <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I, I, appreciate, I appreciated you guys having me, and I appreciate the time here that we spent together getting to know each other a little bit. It sounds like you guys are going to have some fun tonight uh, with uh, your ice cream. Uh, I'm going to have to get uh, ready here because i got to leave early in the morning for New York. So I'm gonna. I got about a 10-hour drive ahead of me tomorrow morning. Oh, you're going to drive. I was going to say, you're going to fly. No, you're going to drive while... Well. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you spending the time to share your message with us. I know that there are people that were on here today that have not been on here uh, uh, yet this feast that I think really wanted to hear what you had to say. And so we appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, Thank today. you for the opportunity. I appreciate have the opportunity and invited. Yeah, you have a safe drive on, on up. Hopefully you'll see some good fall colors. Uh, yeah. Start yeah. to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I fully expect that up there in the... Uh, Catskills, I think it is Catskill Mountains. Well, thanks for working it out for us, Bill. We, I've, you know, I've been looking for ever since you and I talked. Goodness gracious, we talked a long time ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, but it, my pleasure, Skip. Thanks for letting me have the opportunity, and thank you all for listening uh, to me and being such a, a great group of folk. Okay, really let's good. see. Let's see who's uh, who's here. Hang on, uh, John Wilson. Is your mic working? Could you close us out today? Yes. Almighty Father, we do thank you for this day that you brought before us. We thank you for helping and guiding Bill through this uh, wonderful message that he gave, something that we can really learn and be refreshed on over. We thank you for bringing us all together for the feast this week with everybody, regardless of circumstances and where they're located, uh, for you to be protected, you to protect them and guide them and guide the words and the speaking of all the speakers who are gonna be uh, giving the messages and to open the ears of everybody to hear your word as you want them to hear it. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings you've given us. Guide us, continue to guide us through this feast and help us to stay on the path that you want us to be on toward your way of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Thanks, John. Okay. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right. You guys be safe. Stay healthy. Thanks. You likewise. Have a safe trip.